Welcome back to Educator. Next we're going to talk about a class of reactions called substitution reactions. Let's take a look at an example of such a reaction. Here we have hydroxide reacting with chloromethane and our product has uh, where the chlorine used to be on the carbon chain we've replaced it now with the OH group and the chlorine is now on its own as chloride. So this is described as a substitution since we have replaced one group with another group, we've substituted, and, uh, and let's define some of the players in this reaction. This first species I've labeled NU dot dot, that stands for nucleophile, so I'm going to be using the abbreviation NU with a lone pair, and a nucleophile is defined as something that is electron rich, so typically we'll see a lone pair on a nucleophile, we'll also see examples where a pi bond can behave as a nucleophile. It can have a negative charge, like our nucleophile in this case is hydroxide, we see a negative charge. But a very nice uh, abbreviation for nucleophile is NU with a lone pair. That lone pair right away gives you a, some, a clue as to the behavior of this nucleophilic species. And because it's electron rich, a nucleophile is going to be seeking an electron deficient, deficient species. The next part in this reaction is described as the electrophile. A very handy abbreviation for electrophile is E+. Plus. Again, that kind of tells us something about the species because electrophiles are things that are electron poor. Now, it might be possible that you'll see you know, a positive charge to show the electron deficiency, or more likely what we'll usually have is a partial positive. Uh, and that's true for this electrophile here. It's a neutral species. There are no charges. But because this chlorine is pulling electron density away from the carbon, the carbon uh, is in fact partially positive and that's what makes him a good electrophile. <clears throat> an electrophile is something that seeks an electron rich species. Oh, I should mention, where does the name electrophile comes, come from? It's called an electrophile because it is electron loving. Right? And that makes sense. If, if it is electron deficient, it's going, to be, it's going to be seeking electrons, loving electrons. A nucleophile is called such because it is nucleus loving. And what sort of things do we have in the nucleus of an atom? We have protons. We have positively charged species. So a, nucleus, a nucleophile is something that is seeking out uh, electron deficient species. And electrophiles are something that are electron deficient, seeking out electron rich species. So what we have here with the nucleophile electrophile pair really is, is just a perfect match. Uh, and we're going to see that nucleophiles and electrophiles coming together are going to explain the vast majority of the organic reactions we're going to be seeing down the road. Now the other part in this equation is uh, in this case played by the chloride. It's called the leaving group. And uh, which uh, I'm just going to abbreviate LG. Sometimes it's just abbreviated with an L. And this, as the name implies, is a group that leaves. And as it leaves, it takes its two electrons with it. So you can see that the, this, this bond ended up leaving with the chloride because now it has four lone pairs of electrons. And that's going to be true of all of our leaving groups. They'll take electrons with them. And we're also going to be learning about what makes a good leaving group. We'll find that stable groups, things that are stable on their own, would make very good leaving groups. And uh, things that are weak bases are typically pretty stable. So we'll look for that, those sorts of features. So a general reaction, um, and, and I, I should also mention that this leaving group we had here is a chloride. So for example, X minus makes a very good uh, leaving group. We'll see chloride, bromide, iodide as a, as a very common leaving group that we can have. And these are weak, all weak bases because you know, it's conjugate. If you look at HCl, how do we describe HCl? We know that is a strong acid. And so that tells us that the conjugate base chloride is a very weak base, very stable, and so they make very good leaving groups. So overall, the general reaction for the substitution reactions we're going to be studying in organic chemistry look like this. There's some kind of nucleophile reacting with some kind of carbon chain. This R represents a carbon chain that has a leaving group on it. And when the reaction is done, that R group is going to have the nucleophile bonded to it in place of the leaving group. And the leaving group is going to now be on its own, and typically with, a, with an extra lone pair and a negative charge. So if this is our general reaction, what are some things we can study about it? Well, what if we wanted to understand the mechanism by which these starting materials get converted to these products? What are the possible mechanisms for a substitution reaction? Well, there's really 
two reasonable possibilities. One possibility would be a simultaneous mechanism, or in other words, a concerted mechanism, in which the nucleophile attacks the carbon, starts to form the bond with the carbon group at the same time as the leaving group leaves. That would be just a single step mechanism that would accomplish the transformation. And this mechanism actually does exist. We'll be studying this. This mechanism is called the SN2 mechanism, a, a simultaneous concerted single step mechanism. Okay, but another possibility is that we have a stepwise mechanism in which the leaving group leaves first. Now, if the leaving group leaves, what does that leave behind on this carbon? This carbon is now missing a bond, so this would end up being a carbocation. And then that carbocation could combine with the nucleophile to give our substitution product. And in fact, that mechanism happens as well. This mechanism is known as the SN1 mechanism. So we're going to be learning both about this concerted mechanism and this stepwise mechanism, uh, and, and they're called the SN2 and the SN1. We'll start with the SN2 mechanism. And uh, here's an example of such a mechanism. We said this is the one-step mechanism. So what does it look like? We could show arrows to um, follow the electron path, the electron movement and the bonding. Our nucleophile, I'm sorry, we should leave with these guys. This group that is coming in and doing the substituting, we describe as a nucleophile. Here again, we have something that's a lone pair and a negative charge. The alcohalide here is going to be our electrophile. Now again, why is it electrophilic? I don't see any electron deficient species. Well, sure, that carbon bearing the leaving group, bearing the halogen is in fact partially positive. So there is going to be an attraction between this electron rich nucleophile and this electron deficient carbon and that's what's going to uh, help form this bond. As that bond is formed, this carbon iodine bond is going to break and those electrons are going to go to the iodide. And so there's our mechanism, just two arrows, single step, and we get our two products. This is our substitution product and this is our leaving group. Remember we labeled him the leaving group. Now th the direction of attack of the nucleophile onto the carbon bearing the leaving group is described as backside attack. The nucleophile has to come in from the opposite face of the where the leaving group is. That's the only possible attack to get that leaving group to leave and have the uh, orbitals interact properly. So we're going to see the uh, consequences of that shortly. Okay, let's talk about the kinetics of the reaction, the things that affect the rate of the reaction. The rate of the SN2 is given by the following rate expression. The rate is proportional to both the concentration of the methoxide, the CH3O3O minus, sorry, the CH3O minus, our nucleophile, and the concentration of the ethyl iodide. Let's just abbreviate this CH3CH2. We could abbreviate that as ethyl, ET for ethyl. So in other words, the rate in the rate expression, we find both the nucleophile and the electrophile. That's, th that's why this reaction is described as a bimolecular reaction. You add up the exponents, the, each of these are to the first power. So it is a bimolecular reaction, and that's where the SN2 comes from. That's the, what the 2 represents in the name, is that it's the bimolecular reaction. It has both the nucleophile and the electrophile coming together in the one step of the reaction. Now we'll find that sterics play a big role in the rate of the SN2, so let's see some examples of that.